1,200 men who were not infected, who were held as a control group, also black men. Over the course of 40 years, these men were duped into thinking that they were in a treatment program, but they weren't. They were given pink pills, which, as it transpired, were simply aspirin. They were given spinal taps, which, as it transpired, were not for the good of their health or to monitor their health, but rather to um, ensure a supply of sera for the development of a syphilis test. So they were used over 40 years, even after the advent of penicillin. When penicillin was recognized as a cure, it was withheld from these men. And this was between what, uh, what, what was a 40-year span? 1932 to 1972. How many people knew about this at the time? How did it stop? Hundreds of people knew about it because there were regular reports in the medical journals, and it was actually presented at an American Medical Association meeting in 1965. There were also numerous meetings of governmental agencies where they periodically would ask, should we continue the experiment or not? And the decision was always yes, we should continue the experiment. It's worth noting that the Surgeon General, Thomas Perrin, had taken on syphilis eradication as his mission. And yet, when penicillin was devised and he had the cure, he made the decision to continue the experiment because he said, they represent an opportunity that will never come again. What happened to the untreated men? Uh, the untreated men, as you can well imagine, um, many of them died horrible deaths, you know. They were not only infected with syphilis that was untreated, but these were also very poor men, sharecroppers. Uh, their median income was a dollar a day. But being sharecroppers, they rarely saw any money. And um, they were debilitated beyond their years by syphilis and the prostrating labor. And um, so many of them died, you know, very bad deaths from syphilis, they suffered, the secondary stage of syphilis is very um, painful. It constitutes running sores, you know, heart abnormalities, and the last stage of syphilis is devastating, neurologically devastating. Not everyone progresses to the last stage, you know, fortunately. But you can't predict who will and who won't, so everyone should be treated. Now, this 40-year period obviously spanned both Democratic and Republican administrations uh, in charge of the United States Public Health Service. Did your research un uncover anybody who actually uh, raised alarm and, and, and questioned, I mean, not, not just asked should we continue it, but mm -hmm. actually tried to oppose uh, and call for an end to this experimentation. Two people. One was Dr. Irvin Schatz of Detroit, who wrote a letter to the Public Health Service after they published an article in a premier medical journal. And he said, I'm shocked and astonished that you are permitting these men to continue um, um, dying of a treatable disease. And there is a note attached to his letter by a physician who writes, I'm not going to answer this. And indeed, they didn't. The other person was Peter Buxton, and he was a young Polish immigrant who was responsible for ending the study because he was a low-level interviewer with the Public Health Service, and he was shocked when he discovered it. He questioned it. Uh, at the risk of his job, he could easily have been dismissed even for questioning it. And um, what I found really chilling is the fact that he would write these letters, very brave of them, protesting it. And after he wrote enough of them, these doctors called him into a room where they all sort of sat arrayed against him, very intimidating, and lectured him, explaining to him the scientific process and why they were right to do this. Well, Buxton didn't agree. He left the PHS, went to law school, and through his entire four, three years of law school, kept writing these letters. And when he got no response, when they gave him the same silent tr treatment Dr. Schatz had gotten, he called a journalist friend. And the AP ran the story, and the rest is history. And are there any of the doctors who are involved in these experiments who are still practicing? Uh, unfortunately, none of them, none of the doctors who conducted the experiment are alive. I say unfortunately. Because I think one of the great tragedies of the study is that the miscreants have gone unpunished. I say their names whenever I can, because you never read of the names of the people who were the architects of the study. It was Thomas Morell, O.C. Wenger. These um, men and Thomas Perrin, others like them, perpetuated the study. And yet there's been, you know, no... They were never um, accused of anything. Nothing castigated them. They apparently obviously have gotten off scot-free. And blame has been deflected on a nurse, you know, who was arguably the lowest person on the medical totem pole. And she's been made, um, Eunice Rivers has been made to bear the brunt of this study, when actually the people who devised it were never challenged. When Clinton was president, he apologized to the survivors? Yes. Were there any reparations? Um, 
There weren't reparations as such, but something very important did come out of study materially, and that was the establishment of the National Center of Bioethics at Tuskegee University. That's very important because um, this is um, a bioethics center staffed and run by black people at a historically black university. And um, they have been working very hard to, number one, educate people about the real legacy of Tuskegee and also involve Af African Americans in bioethics and specifically in the medical research pro process. So that was a very, very important result. We're talking to Harriet Washington, who's written the book Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present. Can you talk about Holmesburg Prison? And I yeah. ask about this because there's this latest news about a federal panel um, talking about um, loosening regulations around experimentation on prisoners. So if you could address both. Sure. I'm actually going to start with the federal panel, which um, just a few months ago made a recommendation that prisons, which have been mostly closed to research since the 1970s, be reopened. This is a very bad decision, and although it's not legally binding, all indications are that the government is going to take this recommendation, reopen prisons. And the reason why this is a problem is if you look at the history of research in prisons, it's been the site of the worst abuses, very troubled. Um, there were experimental agents administered, men were crippled, killed, there were mind control experiments. And the worst thing about it is that the concept of consent in a prison is very problematic. The course of nature of prison makes it very difficult for a prisoner to say no. Uh, y you also uh, indicate that uh, obviously that a lot of this experimentation has continued. You, you had the one example in, in one chapter of a of a gentleman, Casper Yagen, a 68-year-old retired auto mechanic and who disappeared in 1977. Right. And could you talk about that? Yeah, that case was quite chilling because that's where I talk about the use of blacks for um, anatomical dissection. When Yagen disappeared, his family sought, you know, search from high and low, and he, they called the um, hospitals repeatedly and were told he wasn't there. But he turned up to be on a laboratory slab about to undergo dissection. He had died and was being dissected. And this indicates that black people have been used much more often for anatomical dissection against their will. Where? Wh what Everywhere. laboratory? Lab Everywhere. Slab, though, in this case of this man. Oh, this was interesting, Howard Medical School, which is a predominantly African-American school. Um, another theme of the book, which How is did they find him? How did they know this was the man? Well, it turns out he was the only unidentified patient in the hospital during the time his family was told he wasn't there. And the larger issue is that blacks are more likely, are more likely to be, um, have their bodies taken for dissection. Um, it's a result of a long pattern of co-opting the bodies of slaves and then later of poor blacks. That's um, less flagrant now, but still exists. So there's a disparity. So in other words, uh, hospitals might be in the practice if there's, an, if there's an unidentified patient who dies, then using those bodies for uh, dissection without thinking, well, this person belongs to, uh, to some family, some family is looking for them, rather than wait and see if they can be identified and use them for Yeah, uh, and for the system is actually set up to um, make people who are certain people at higher risk, because the system actually says that if a patient dies in a hospital and no one comes to claim the body, it goes to the coroner's office, and the coroner has the option of making the body available for dissection. Well, think about who dies without someone coming to claim the body. Poor people, homeless people, who are more likely to be black or Hispanic. I want to go back to Holmesburg Prison, because you're talking about two kinds of experimentation there. There was the experimentation that you write about where prisoners are injected with staphylococcus and Nelia herpes, other viruses. Also, the doctor in charge, uh, yes. Dr. Kligman, was also doing work for cosmetics companies? That's right. Dr. Albert Kligman made a fortune um, doing this kind of work for pharmaceutical companies and then also became rich working for the government. So um, yes, he um, actually was a dermatologist who went way beyond his field to inject men at the behest of pharmaceutical companies with dangerous chemicals. And cosmetics And companies. cosmetics. So they make a kind of checkerboard, another book written, yeah. Acres of Skin. By Alan Hornblum, very good book. Very interesting book where the cover is a picture of a checkerboard of um, 
where they test different parts of the back of a man with different uh, uh, chemicals to see exactly. how they would react. Exactly. And they would walk around as these checkerboards. Right. And in fact, the prison guard said when he went to the beach in the area, he could tell who'd been in the prison by looking at the patterns on their backs. And so what's come of this? Well, some of the survivors are still around and are suing. They're trying to sue um, the university and Dr. Kligman. But Dr. Kligman himself has been honored, has never, you know, been castigated or sued. And so far, they've been unsuccessful in their suit. Uh, Hornblum is actually helping them a great deal. You know, it's wonderful of him. Yeah, we interviewed.